Our speakers today on the issue of restorative justice are Debbie Melting Tallow, Sherry Tailfeathers, and Leon Daychief. And they're with the Can I Peacemaking Program. So please welcome them. about right here. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon and okay to everyone. Um, my name is Debbie Melting Tallow, and I, I'm with the Kainai Peacemaking Program. Kainai Peacemaking Program is a restorative justice program. And I've been involved with KPP for the last 15 years. And um, I kind of got to liking working with the KPP. It's very interesting and, um, and very, how would you say, uh, educating, because I didn't know much about justice and this and that, other than getting speeding tickets and parking tickets. Um, I'm, I wasn't quite, uh, I didn't really know a lot about law and stuff like that. So when I started with Kainai Peace, Peacemaking, I started Googling, Googling, and getting more information. Plus, I had a few lawyer friends that I would consult, um, especially Ingrid Hess. Um, she was kind of my mentor, too, at the time. But anyways, um, the Kainai Peacemaking Program, it, it, it's been, um, we, like I said, we started 15 years ago. And um, we, it is a part of the Kainai Justice Initiative, and we strive to place the responsibility on keeping peace, order, and balance and harmony back in the hands of the community. So the concept um, was when, back in February, the peacemaking started taking referrals from the court. Now, when I say referrals from the court, um, I'll go to court, the Crown will refer clients, um, de uh, depending on um, circumstances, what the charge was, because we take assaults, common assaults, domestic assaults. In fact, domestic assault was the number one in peacemaking. And that's what we wanted to focus was on domestic, because we wanted to help the victim and the offender, because in the long run, they end up getting back together. So there's a cycle they go through. So we wanted to break that cycle and start working with the offender, which is usually male, but we've had lots of females that were the offender and the victim. And then we started taking on um, assaults, depending. Um, it depends on the offender's history. If he had a long history, he or she had a long history of assaults, well, maybe the Crown will hesitate. But it's to his discretion, the Crown, to refer them. And once they're referred to our program, um, they go through an intake, which I do the intake into our program. I explain our program, what we're all about, and, um, and then they're in, in the program. And then they start working with Sherry and Leon. And uh, I help out too in some cases with facilitating, especially with the youth, because um, they open the doors to start accepting youth 
offenders, I think it was about two years later after we had started. And um, so prior to that, um, there was 10 community members from the reserve, the blood tribe, that were appointed to uh, work with Kainai peacemaking as our elders because it's all elder based where they sit with the elder, the elder gives recommendations. After the first initial visit, um, the facilitator will read what the offender did. So from there, the elder will take that um, and have a meeting with the client. And then the elder will say, okay, maybe you need anger management. Maybe you need addictions counseling. Maybe personal counseling. Any kind of counseling that the elder feels that the client um, needs, the client needs. And um, since, since 2009, from 10 peacemakers, we now have 17 that uh, were peacemaking elders that we work with. And um, restorative justice hasn't been new to Kainai, uh, to the Kainai people. It's been, it's, we've been addressing these most of our life. However, it was implemented to start a peacemaking program on the, on the blood reserve. And a lot of our offenders are from the Cardston court, because if you do a wrong on the reserve, the blood reserve, um, it is usually the blood tribe police or the Cardston RCMP that will lay charges. They come to court in Cardston, and that's where our most majority of our referrals are from Cardston, and also from Fort McLeod. We have a few. We used to come here to Lathbridge, uh, but since COVID, we haven't been attending court here because a new urban um, restorative justice had started up. So we mainly focus on Cardston and Fort McLeod. And just to mention, we used to go to Pincher Creek too, to court there. We would get referrals from there. And Brockett, the Beacony, Beacony started a peacemaking program. So a lot of their offenders are referred to that peacemaking. And, um, and then we network with them. We network with a lot of the peacemaking, um, peacemaking um, places such as uh, Siksika. They've got their own. And usually if a blood reserve member gets into trouble, in Siksika that way, they're, they're usually referred to our program because it's better for them to come back because they've moved back to the reserve. It's no sense for them to be traveling back and forth. But anyways, through the referral program, um, like I said, we deal with court, with the courts. The Crown Prosecutor will make the referral and um, and usually the uh, police too. We've just started up a pre-charge through the police on the Blood Tribe Nation, and we've got a few pre-charge. Pre-charge meaning before we lay, before the police lay charges on the person, uh, they would like them to come through our program first and see how they do, and if they do exceptionally well, uh, the police won't go ahead and lay the charges. But of course, if they don't complete, they have to get, they'll have to be charges there. And not only, not only that, but uh, we get referrals from social agencies, um, 
such as some of the departments on the blood reserve. Uh, we do mediation if there's employees that uh, are not getting along with other employees. So we do mediation there. So Kainai peacemaking is very broad. It's not just for uh, offenders through the justice system. And, um, and just to say that everything that we do is strictly confidential. We don't talk about who, our, who the clients are in our program. Everything is held in confidence because there's a lot of trust issues in some of our people. So we make it where everything is confidential and uh, we keep it that way. Once they're done the program, I shred the intake because there's no sense for me to keep it. And, um, and basically, that's what um, our, our uh, program is about. We have traditional values that we use, but I'm still learning how to pronounce them in our language. However, we, we use these principles, and it's a sense of the sacred, uh, respect, being kind and gentle. Uh, once they come into our program, we treat them just like how we would treat our family members. We don't interrogate them, rough them up and stuff like that. We treat them, you know, we want them to be, we are, we're kind to them and in return, we want them to be kind to us. And in harmony, we work in harmony. We get whoever's involved, the victim, or if it's the youth, we get mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, whoever is um, raising the youth to come in to know about our program and what the youth are gonna be doing and what, um, what recommendation is given to them. Um, generosity, truthfulness, truthfulness is uh, a priority too. Um, thankfulness, courage, and achievement, what we've achieved. Once the client is done, um, what I do is I'll, I'll get a report from either Leon or Sherry. I'll do up a report to the Crown. This is what our client did what kind of counseling they went through, and uh, basically things, good things that they're doing, good things that gave them growth to be better people. And once I hand it to the Crown, it's up to the Crown and the judge, their discretion, to throw the charge out. And my 15 years with Kainai Peacemaking, I've never known where a judge did not accept our report. They are happy with it. They question the offender. What did you get out of the program? The offender will explain to them, let them know what they got out of it. And um, then after that, it's thrown out. They don't have a criminal record. And that's what I forgot to mention earlier. That's what we are trying to do is help people not have a criminal record. And so, because we all know that a criminal record isn't very good to have, especially with our youth and the younger because they're gonna go to school, they're gonna go to college, university, find a job, and they don't need this record on them. And um, I think that's about it that I've had to say. Okay, Mr. Nitaniga Mokkin Saki. It's my Blackfoot name, which means elbow woman. I received that from my late grandma, Marion Goodstriker, when I was born, because I was born in Calgary at the Holy Cross Hospital. So the Elbow River runs through, runs through the hospital there. So I carry my name very proud. I also have uh, two daughters, 
Nicole, her Blackfoot name is Anatikiayaki, that was given to her in a sweat when she was three years old, and that means pretty bear woman. My other daughter, the youngest one, is Tikawutan, white shield woman, that's Sheena's name, and I only have one grandson, so I had ceremony at my house when he was seven months old. I had my father's name transferred to him, which is beat, walking on top. I don't know if any of you may have seen my dad's artwork, but uh, my dad was the late Gerald Tailfeathers. So his legacy still lives on. I've been in contact with a few people from the Glenbow Foundation um, to uh, showcase his out, out artwork. Two years ago, uh, Glenbow had a two paintings that they put at the, in the bus stop in Calgary in the southwest area. And I had conversation through email from my sister Pam who works at Canada Place in Edmonton. She's with, um, uh, she's with Program Something in Edmonton. She's been there for quite a few years. And they, she had asked permission from the siblings if Glenbow could use one of my dad's artwork. It's very particular how we can, we can't, she can't just go ahead and say yes without permission from the siblings because of the legality issues. So my role with the Kainai Peacemaking Program um, is community and liaison worker. I've been with KPP for 15 years. I just celebrated February 9th of my 15 years of service. I'd like to acknowledge my past co-worker, uh, Carol Sakia. I was so shocked when she came up to me when I walked in, because we used to work together at uh, Provincial Social Service uh, as a team. There was Carol, Marge Fox, and myself. We took care of the uh, Native families here in Lethbridge. So Carol, it was so awesome to see you. So my role, um, once, uh, as Debbie mentioned, once the referrals um, come, she does the intake. So I work with um, a lot of the uh, clients that Debbie mentioned. We, we're getting a lot of domestic assaults. So I like to pair up um, elders that are couples so that you could look at it from a male and female point of view to work with the clients. Uh, clients are with us for three months, and my scheduling is based on six visits, so that's every two weeks, six visits. The elders will make recommendations, <coughs> excuse me, too, uh, and I help them where they can go for, for help. Um, I've done a lot of uh, on-site referral visits, uh, Lethbridge, Cardston, Fort McLeod, mental health and addictions. I've done site visit uh, with ADAC here in Lethbridge, uh, associates counseling, and then we have our own resource uh, uh, supports on the reserve blood tribe department of health. Uh, we have a parenting program that I used to facilitate years ago, but I could no longer do that because at the time, what, 15 years ago, I was uh, working at Cardston High School. And I couldn't do the, the, the parenting program because it was interfering with my current job that I have now. So I have to give that up. So one of our elders, one of our peacemakers, um, Harriet Heavy Runner, facilitates that program along with other um, workers there in Cardston. So it's a really good program. It's a 12-week program that runs to help our, our, um, our young people learn about how to parent their children and that because so much was lost. I'm a, um, a survivor of the residential school. My parents went to residential school. My grandmother, I didn't, I was too young when I lost my grandpa, but I have to tell you something. This ice cream shop and I was sitting there and I was looking. My parents used to bring me there when I was young. I still remember the ice cream cones. Oh, the ice cream was so good there. It was <laughs> awesome. And I kept looking at that. Is it still open? So when did it close? <laughs> so um, 
I really enjoy working with the elders. We really have installed our Blackfoot values, our ways that we could work with people. And one of them that is that Gimme Bipitsin. In fact, yesterday was that pink shirt day, the anti-bullying, the kids wore pink, people wore pink, to be kind, to be kind to people. You know, you treat people with respect and in turn you'll get that too. And um, also I'd like to mention that um, we've had a lot of uh, crisis on the reserve and I'm sure Lethbridge has with the opiates. So we're dealing with a lot of crisis on the reserve. Okay, I'll turn it over to Leon, my supervisor. He'll talk about more about our culture. Okay, let's do a coke computasi. My name is Gray Horse. It was given to me by one of the previous um, leaders or spiritual leaders, uh, Rod Mukumukutupi, first rider. Um, I'm recently uh, put in a position, actually hired as in position as a supervisor for the KPP program. I just celebrated my first year just recently in November. So I haven't been with them too long, but I have learned a lot of information and in, in, in regards to how the process works with our, with our people on the reserve. Also with the relationship building within the agencies like um, Sherry was indicating, there's a lot of footwork in that process. I'm really grateful to have Debbie and, and, and Sherry with us in this program because their footwork does go a long way in establishing what is needed between the, in the confines of the legal system, like with the agencies and referring, and like they both indicated. Um, so in that essence though, um, I got up to speak on the spiritual part of our program. Um, um, a previous spiritual, one of the spiritual leaders is one term ago. So um, a lot younger than my, my counterparts here, but in spirit, in our in our spiritual way, um, I would cons consider them my children, as well as all of you guys in our way. So, if I was to introduce myself traditionally, I would say, "Okay, the two quacks mean all my children." So, in that way, it's a little bit different in a multi-lens situation like we have here today, right? So, there's our elders that are fluent in Blackfoot, and then we have our parents that are semi-fluent in Blackfoot. And then you have myself where we're kind of like the tail end of the Blackfoot part. And then we have our children that are barely speak Blackfoot. So to bring this sensibility to the court system, it's a lot of work in translation, um, especially when in discussing like the spiritual component of what we do, um, which is which thrives on um, the knowledge that we have from our, our elders that we utilize in the program. Um, when we pair them with our clients, we usually go on, like, let's say, on, on a sense that they're going to be beneficial or on the lines of the stories we've heard of working with them previously or, or just not working with them but in, in confidence, but as a friendly conversation, you can pretty much understand the individual, that is, what, how they're going to contribute to the person in life, to their traumas and the situation as to why they're with our program. And in that essence, though, <clears throat> recently I wanted to measure how successful that communication was between the lenses for our people. Is, it, is there a lot of miscommunication or is everybody attaining what this need to be? And I believe before uh, the 15 years, it, it, it is still trying, but we're still working at it constantly and conventionally by, again, trying to transcribe and translate um, in terms where our elders understand and then where the three of us have to come to courts and explain the situation in English, which kind of takes a little bit to, to transcribe. But I believe we do a good job with the support of our elders, the ones we have, the 17 in our program. Um, they're really good at what they do. And we've had a revisitism of, I think it's what, 95% over the years that we've been in, in, in existence. And again, we're just constantly working at what we do with our, with our clients so they change with times. So I'd just like to say that part. And I wish we weren't late so we could have shared more, but thank you for having us.
We'll go uh, try and get directly into the question Q&A session here. Um, I'd just like to very briefly uh, say that if you want to buy memberships, Terry's here, I think. Yep, there he is. Okay. Um, we want to thank LSCO for providing this room. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their support. And thanks to Rogers TV for recording the sessions. You can watch SACPA on Rogers TV or... Uh, our website or the archives on YouTube. It'll all be there. And thank you to the Lethbridge Herald as well for their coverage. Next week the speaker will be RCMP Constable Heather Bangle talking about ICE, the Internet Child Exploitation Unit, the work that they do and she's coming down out of Calgary for that. So if there are questions please line up where Canute is here along the wall and um, I will have the, if the, if you can all come up if you like and be ready for questions if you want to stand over there. I think that's good. Okay. Any questions? Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, my question relates to there's an old saying, uh, an ounce of prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure. Uh, do you do some work in the schools, for example, and, and uh, other places where, where the young people get together? Do you, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Okay, um, again, going back to our elders, our elders sit on various boards on our community. So we have one that sits with uh, kind of high school, is Rose Fox, where she kind of comes in and brings a different element because she works uh, actually is like once or twice a week with the kids we have on the reserve. So in that essence, she brings that traditional teaching to them while speaking on um, issues like in rega regards to like healthy relationships and communication, things that contribute to that I wouldn't say the ultimate cure, but in, in bringing on the, the crime and that and so forth. Hey, so this is, these are elements and where, again, that multi-lens, she brings her, her teachings because she's really fluent in both English and Blackfoot. No, go ahead. No, that's my, fine. My name's Henning Mundell, but I have to turn that way because otherwise yeah. I get heck from the yeah. not recording. No, I stepped up because okay. I was standing on this. I okay. didn't want to trip. Um, my, my question relates to uh, your presentation and your mentioning that when you have dealt with a uh, case and then you tear up the records. Now, uh, do you, my question is, do you have uh, uh, an indication of how many people you see multiple times, especially you two who have uh, do done with this for 15 years? So in other words, do you have a high recidivism, people that do it again, uh, or uh, is it mostly new cases if you don't keep the records? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. What I was just telling Leon, um, there's always room to, for improvement in our program. And with each new manager, supervisor, there's always change. And uh, what I mentioned to him was starting April 1st, I want to start doing stats on recidivism. I have a hard time pronouncing that word. But anyways, people who have um, been charged, they came through our program, and they did well, and, um, and then next thing they'll get charged again, and usually it's with the same thing. So yes, we do have not a high, but a moderate um, repeaters that have come through our program. And uh, usually what we try to do is their second time around, and if they made that mistake, 
uh, I call it mistake, I don't say crime. They did a crime. Mistake sounds nicer. When they make that mistake, and if they were under the influence of alcohol when they made that mistake again, we would send them off, send them off to a treatment facility. And uh, once they're completed, um, they come back into our program and finish the program along with the elders. Um, yeah, so that's what uh, I want to start doing is keeping stats on the repeaters that come through our program. And it would be really interesting to find that, how high it is, or how moderate or how low. But right now I'm saying it's moderate, it's not high. Um, like one thing we have to take consideration is uh, we have a really slim picking in resources that we do have for our people um, and that's why we're constantly working on building relationships with outside communities because a lot of our people do travel off reserve and we'd like to accommodate them as well so in that transition um, I think that's where the numbers are going to start coming through this new data entry system we are using now. Uh, my name is Terry Shillington, and uh, I had two questions. One of them, uh, Henning an asked the question about repeat offenders, and you've dealt with that. Um, my other question is around how, so you've been in business 15 years, roughly. I wonder what you've learned and how the program has evolved over those, those 15 years. You, you have likely uh, changed and evolved and grown, and I'm curious about what you've learned. Um, when I st first started working with Kainai Peacemaking, Feb February, March, 15 years ago, prior to that I was an accountant for 24 years with the land management. And then stepping into a restorative justice was, whoa, I've got a lot to learn because I was an accountant, <laughs> and then to switch to that. And like I had mentioned before, um, my mentor was Ingrid Hess. I would run to her about a lot of things. And what I see that I've learned and grown was I was not um, raised in the traditional way. Uh, my family, the many fingers, um, never took part in the sun dances, ceremonies, and that. We were Catholics. We were raised Catholics. So when I went into this program, uh, one of the elders, which um, is my relation, Wilton Goodstriker, we had a talk about it, and he says, you're going to learn, and you're going to grow from this program. You're going to learn a lot, because we are going to be doing all-night smokes, which is the elders get together, the societies get together, and they smoke the pipe, face painting, traditional stuff. So I've been learning a lot about our culture that I never really knew about it when I was growing up. But the last 15 years, I've learned so much about our traditional values and um, what um, I just used to go to the Sundance just to watch what people do, what they do. But now I go up there knowing and understanding what is behind the Sundance, the all night smokes, the face painting that I never really knew. And I'm glad, I'm glad, and this is where I grew of knowing about our traditions. And um, so what I do is I balance our traditional and the Western Catholic. And I like it that way. And yeah, that's what I've learned. And helping our youth kind of understand too about our traditional ways as best as I can explain to them. Thank you. Okay, my field of study is totally opposite from an accountant. Uh, yep. my, uh, my education is in corrections, and uh, I was a police officer when I was, geez, really in my early 20s. 
And I could only do that for 18 months because I had to raise my daughter at the same time. So I had my mother doing that. So my oldest daughter is Kipitapuka, uh, which means the oldest grandchild. So, and I did my uh, practicum uh, in the provincial building with uh, probation. And I wanted to veer in that direction. However, um, it didn't work out that way. So uh, I sat on the Youth Justice Committee and uh, working with youth, still in the field of law. And uh, I was th with them for probably three or four years. And then I started, I've always worked with people front line. So working with peacemaking, I really had to uh, change my hat, I guess, um, because when you do police work and you do corrections, it's the victim, it's the offender, the offender. So working with this uh, restorative justice program, I really had to switch the hats and look at it from a different point of view. And uh, I've really learned a lot from our elders and uh, just how they present things, their, our values, our culture. I've always been involved in our ways since I was young. Our, my, uh, my mother on the good striker side were very traditional and not, and one of our advisors, Wilton Goodstriker, is my first cousin, so I've learned a lot from some of his advice and that through this uh, whole peacemaking. And talking about recidivism, um, with the cases I've dealt with in the last 15 years, I haven't seen too many repeaters with my caseload. So whether they've really learned through life as they walk their journey, or they're just getting involved with the wrong people at the wrong time. But it would be very interesting because I know uh, Wilton, he worked in uh, Edmonton as a police officer. He's worked in corrections for a long time. And what measures our program, the peacemaking program, is that our Blackfoot ways and culture really stands out. That's why our, our percentage is high in the 90s. So recidivism is something that we're going to always go through because people are different in their walks of life, in their lifestyles and everything. So I hope that answers you all your questions. Uh, for myself, it's the complete opposite. So I have like 20 years experience working in social the social field. Um, I have an education is, um, in uh, social work and uh, diploma in mental health. But for over the 20 years that I have, um, I've worked with youth and adults in, it, um, I wouldn't say behavioral centers. And so a lot of them were mandated from court. So I have a greater outlook on what is needed um, because some of the ones I used to work with youth are now my clients as adults. So it, it's brought me kind of like full circle to really understand um, this process that it's new to our people, but then at the same time, it's old, but we're trying to help it with with our culture. And one of the things that I've learned is to um, really be patient because there's so many objectives from both the court and our elders that they placed on the three of us. Like for myself, I have 25 clients. Debbie has six, and I believe Sherry has 12. So it's a lot of individuals we work with on a daily basis, plus the court and the referrals that we do utilize. I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. I don't think you can beat your local culture for caring for these people. I don't think you can beat your local culture for caring your own people. My question is, do the RCMP, the Blood Tribe Police, get a bonus where it's a pre-charge and you cut down on the amount of money they spend and the paperwork they have to do? So are you getting a positive feedback from cutting that, making that circle smaller for them? <coughs> I think like, sorry, um, in situations like car reservation where it's over 15,000 people and we have a police force, I believe it's over 25, I think. Um, and then the vast size of our community, um, they're always in need of support and also more officers and funding to get 
to a situation where hopefully we're us as social workers and KPP workers that were out of the job and everything just changes right but in actuality um, I think in going forward this is where in the essence of that relationship and the success going down like you spoke of I think it just comes back to again that relationship that we established with both agencies the police forces the crown the judges and ourselves and the people we work with as I would like to add that um, we have right now we have two cases of pre-charge from the blood tribe and I am working with both youth and that I don't think blood tribe want any kind of bonus or whatever like it's just that they want us to work with the person the people the youngsters um, and before like before they're charged and going back five years ago before COVID, a young gal from the reserve assaulted one of the RCMP members in Cardston. And thank, I like to thank the Judge Auger. Um, she had orchestrated a peacemaking right in the courthouse with the young lady, the RCMP, the elder in that. And it just, it was just, excellent to see the young gal apologize for her actions and the RCMP apologize for his actions. So, and this is what I like to see. Everybody leaves as winners. We don't want any losers. We want everybody to win and leave happy and that they're satisfied. Thank you. I'm Bev Mundell-Atherstone. Thank you very much for all of you, not just for coming, but for the work that you do and have been doing. <coughs> um, I'm quite curious, what is the age of the youngest member that's gone through KPP and the oldest? You might know those. And uh, approximately how many people have gone through in 15 years? And uh, then I'm also quite curious, um, um, oh, it's, it's gone, but you answer those two and I'll have my third question. <laughs> yeah, I can speak to that. I had a case um, probably two years ago, a 13-year-old. Uh, he had a lot of charges and also uh, he was a student in McGrath um, High School. And because I worked in Cardston at the high school, so I had connections with the uh, psychologist right in Cardston, Conrad Bamey. So I made connections and I sat with him and we emailed each other. So it was too hard for him. It, was, it would be difficult for this young boy to work with an elder. There were some uh, risk factors involved. So um, uh, Conrad Bamey, he just uh, started working with him very closely, one-on-one, -on -one, because he needed some mental health uh, strategies for himself. So that was my youngest, was 13. And for the oldest, um, 66. You mentioned Conrad Bamey. Uh, I'm also a psychologist, oh. and uh, I supervised Conrad for his, for his psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so that's nice to hear. I'm glad he's doing well. <laughs> okay, the other uh, question that I had was how long on the average, uh, you mentioned something about six meetings, every uh, six meetings over every two weeks. It works out to three months. Works out to three months, but as there's some people who need more um, um, meetings, more input over that time, and then how do you arrange that? Thank you so much. Um, just from my experience in working with the client, she was with the program for one year. Uh, mind you, when her court date is up, we would ask for an adjournment, which we always, which the client always gets, so they can continue. And the reason why it took a year is they have these no contact quarters when it comes to domestic dispute and that. So it makes it hard 
for the couple to be together and especially if they have children. And this gal had four children and she was working and so she had to juggle raising her family, working, going to, for counseling and that. And so I would say she was probably one of my longest clients in that. And to this day when I see her, she hugs me, thanks me, blah, 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 that, I, that the elders and I really helped her grow and be more committed to what she wants to do. My thanks as well, and I am Fran Blackwood. I just moved from British Columbia in October, um, and my background is as a parent of children who had difficulty learning to read and spell, and um, oftentimes the psychologist said there are recommendations to follow after sessions, you know, how to go forward, and you mentioned that you have to do a lot of transcribing, and listening to you and looking up some of your words, they're pretty hard to spell. Um, so knowing that literacy rates, you know, 40, about 48% of Canadian adults have difficulty with day-to-day -day reading, and our children aren't doing very well, is there a way to uh, knowing that if kids have trouble learning to read in order to learn um, on independently, do you have the resources to recommend, let's say your youth or even your adults, so they can use other means for self-study and spiritual gain, et cetera, w within your cu culture as you're trying to record it more now? Thank you. And I appreciate the values and the peace you can give your students to go forward knowing you have community support. Thank you. Uh, in addressing your issue, it's a new form of education for our elders. Um, like I was trying to explain earlier that because they're fluency in Blackfoot and their inability to really communicate in English, um, in that essence, what we try to do lately is educate our elders on issues and, and systemic factors that struggle, our people struggle with daily, especially with issues like FAS and so on. Hey, so what we've been doing lately is, through this <clears throat> relationship we're developing is um, having our elders go through these trainings so they understand how to deal with people with FAS and all these other mental issues. So out of that situation, again, um, we were really limited in the resources we have. Um, but the best I could do as their supervisors better educate them and then get training for them so they could better suit it to help with our people. But I would have liked to have funding and a position created just for them. So a person that understands it. And there was what, or a presentation we had with Sabrina Hacker where she really did a good job in explaining to our elders what uh, the effects of FAS was. Hey, so they did not have a better understanding of what alcohol does and so on. So with issues like that, again, all we could do is just better prepare our elders and my coworkers by looking and having them better educated. Yeah. I was granted an, an extra question by our moderator. Uh, I'd be curious to know, uh, you, talk, you spoke about resources. Uh, how is this program funded? By, by the blood tribe, or is it some provincial or federal money involved? Um, we get our funding from Justice Canada. That's where our funding comes from. And um, the Blood Tribe will kick in funds uh, for, like if we were to host, say, a workshop, they would kick in some money too. And right now, um, they're in the process of building a peacemaking center where we work. Because right now we're located out in Laverne, which is close to Glenwood, and we rent office space out there. So right now we've got a peacemaking center that's going up right in standoff. 
so that it would be so much nicer and it'll be our future courthouse. And I imagine justice would keep funding us. We had limited time before you started, and uh, I meant to ask you if you would have a take-home message for us. Is there any final words that any of you would like to say? Putting you on the spot. Could you repeat your question again? Take-home words. Take-home message. Take-home message. Um, I guess just to, in providing clarity in any situation is just um, get more educated on the place where we are today, uh, which is the Blackfoot Territory and the outcomes from when contact had happened would provide more of an outlook onto why our people are the way they are and maybe provide a healthy relationship and communication and going forward so situations like we have here at the, um, the shelter can be resolved sooner than later. Yeah, so just um, I'd share one of our, our um, phrases, or not our phrases, but one of our, what would you call them? I'm lost for words. Our traditional values, give a beep, it's in kind hearted. And, yeah. and this is where you guys would say, ah. Uh. <laughs>